Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You can have a seat a minute. I want to share a couple things with you. I'm going to go to uh, Luke uh, chapter, where do I want to go here? 10. I want to go to Luke 10. Now, in Luke 10, Jesus was commissioning his 70 disciples. You all know he had more than 12, right? Okay, this is where he was sending the 70 out. And he was giving them a commission, and he was giving them instructions, okay, what to do. Uh, you know, go in and preach the gospel of the kingdom, heal the sick, that type of thing, cast out demons, okay? So he was giving them that commission. Same commission he gave the 12, he gave the 70. Same commission he gave the 12 and the 70, he gave to us. Mark chapter 16, right? In my name. Okay, you shall speak in new tongues, cast out demons, okay, preach the gospel, okay, those are the things. And these signs shall follow those who believe, okay, that's us. Now, watch when he was doing this. As, as he did this, he began to give them instructions, and then all of a sudden, in verse 13, something shifted with what Jesus was doing. He was talking to the disciples, he was telling them what to do, where to go, you know, how to, you know, the, your needs will be provided for you. He gives them all these instructions, and all of a sudden, he switches, Verse 13, he switches his conversation in the midst of talking to his disciples, and he begins to speak to something else. And I want you to see it in here. Verse number 13, he makes a statement, Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. Now, what, now what, what is Chorazin and what is Bethsaida? Does anybody know what these two, these two things that he just named? Chorazin and Bethsaida. Do you know what those are? Those are cities. Those are cities. And he said, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, those are two cities also, they would have repented long ago sitting in sackcloth and ashes, and it would be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than you. And now he speaks to another. He says, and you, Capernaum. Now, now who's this? Another, another, this is the third one he's speaking to. Another city. Capernaum is a city. Okay. Woe to you, Capernaum, you who are exalted to heaven. I want you to see this. You'll be brought down to Hades. How, how do you speak to a city? Okay, this is Jesus. He's given instructions to his disciples, switches gears, and starts speaking to cities. How many know he's not really speaking to a city? He's speaking to the principalities over the city. He's prophesying to the enemies that are over those, to the principalities and the powers and the rulers of darkness and the spiritual wickedness and having to place That's what he's speaking to. So when he's speaking to Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, he's not speaking to a city. He's speaking to the principalities that are ruling, ruling spirits that are over those cities, territorial spirits. You understand that? Okay, that's what he's doing. Now, do you know what he's about to do? He just got done giving instructions to the 70 disciples to go into those cities, okay, and bring the kingdom of God by preaching the gospel and healing the sick. That's what he sent them in to do. Guess what happens when you preach the gospel and you work the works of God and you move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Guess what happens? Those principalities are broken down, you see, because watch. You ready for this? Verse 17, a little bit of time lapse here happened. Then the 70 returned. So they went out and did the job that Jesus had sent them for. They went out into those cities, preached the gospel, and healed the sick. Guess what happened? They returned with joy, and they said this, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. They come back and tell Jesus that. Now, how many know this isn't a surprise to Jesus? He's not surprised at this. Okay? You know what Jesus says? He looks at them and said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, I personally believe that when he said that, he was referring to a few weeks before when he prophesied to his disciples that the principalities over these cities were going to come down. He just got done saying it. He said, Bethsaida, Capernaum, uh, Chorazin. He said, you who are exalted to the heavens, what's going to happen? You're going to be brought down. When the people of God went into that city, began to proclaim the name of Jesus, 
guess what happened? Those principalities came down. So when the disciples came back and said, even the demons are subject to us in your name, Jesus said, I know, I saw it. I already prophesied it to you. I already said it. I knew it was coming. I knew you were going to do it. How I many know God's given us a commission to go out and do that? He's already, and it's already done. See, it's already been done in the spirit realm. As we go out and, and take the good news, okay, how beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim the good news. We go, to, we go to the nations. We begin to proclaim the good news. How I many know principalities are coming down? Okay? We're beginning to see those kinds of things that are happening. We have authority. And watch what he, he went on to say in verse number 19. He said, Behold, I give you the authority. Now, this is given to the disciples, which then is us, if you're a disciple, right? I give you the authority to do what? Trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power. How much power of the enemy? All the power of the enemy and nothing. Everybody say nothing. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. We have that authority. We have that power. You see, the, the Bible says that, that we, sh we even in, in Mark 16, it says you can, you can take up serpents. No harm come to you. You can drink poison. No harm come to you, okay, as you're doing it in the name of the Lord. You can, you know, it said in, 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 in Genesis uh, when God pronounced the curse on the serpent. You remember that? He shall bruise your heel, but you shall crush the head of the serpent. Rev, uh, where is it? Romans it says that the God of peace shall, shall shortly crush Satan. Where? Under your feet. Under your feet. That's powerful, isn't it? Wednesday night we were here, and we had a snake come right up that walk and try to get in the door of the church. It was a copperhead. Probably the most poisonous snake in Pennsylvania. We've been in this place for 17 years, and we've never seen a copperhead here in 17 years. But one tried to come up and get in the door Wednesday night. But we had a watchman who was at the door and saw it. You know what he did? He crushed it. He crushed it right out there on that pavement. He walked over there and picked up a big stone, come back across and crush that snake right there. Because nothing shall by any means. You see, this symbolic, as the enemy, try, he's trying to come in. See, the enemy's trying to come in and rob you of your destiny. But the enemy can't rob you of your destiny. Because we have authority over him already. Because Jesus already gave us authority. Amen. We have authority over these spirits. We have these, uh, how many know they're going to come? They're going to attack you, the enemy, but it doesn't matter. No weapon, you see, formed against you shall prosper. It doesn't say weapons won't be formed against you. It said the weapons that are formed against you won't prosper. They'll be formed against you. They just won't prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment shall be what? Condemned. It shall be condemned. We're able to overcome, you know, Revelation 12, 12, 11 says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. Don't forget the next part. <laughs> and love not your lives even unto death, right? As we're committed unto God. That's what's so important. Amen? It's so powerful. And so, see, we have that. We have that authority that's already been given to us by our Savior, by our Lord, who went to the cross and purchased it for us. Amen? Okay, we are getting ready tomorrow. A lot of you don't do that, know this, but tomorrow's June sixth. You know what June sixth is? You know what June sixth is? D Day. You know D Day? Guys, you need to get up on your history. Okay, but June sixth isn't just D Day; it's DDM Day. Because June sixth is our anniversary for Divine Destiny Ministries. June sixth, two thousand two. We began formally, okay, as Divine Destiny Ministries Incorporated uh, 20 years ago. It's a 20 year anniversary. 20 year anniversary. Praise God. And God is good. I want to show, go ahead and um, thank you. Give the Lord a hand clap. I mean, that's powerful. Brenda, get the couple of the pictures ready. I want to show this. But here, you see, understand when we, when we started this church, we had a lot of opposition. We had a lot of attacks, a lot of, a lot of word curses came against us. A lot of lies were spoken against us. But how many know when God's got a plan and you follow through with it, 
You understand what I'm saying? No weapon formed against us. We can, that was our verse for a long time. Because the weapons kept coming. You understand? Words kept being spoken. Lies kept being propagated against us. But guess what? We stood on the foundation of what God had spoken, of what God had said. We began to proclaim because we said we were going to be a church, not just for this community, but also, if you understand, why we have every flag of every nation in this, in this sanctuary, because we speak the nations. We've traveled, my wife and I have traveled all over the world. We've been to what, five, five, five nations in Africa, South America, Central America, Asia. We've been all over the place. And you know what we did when we went to those places? We preached the gospel, healed the sick, and cast out demons. That's what we did. We just took, because the word of God said it, so we did it. We just went and did it. We started doing it. We started proclaiming that. We started, we started sowing into missionaries because we were, we were real big in that. In 20 years, watch this. This is you guys. It's all of us. In 20 years, we have sown over half a million dollars into other nations, in the missions. Half a million. Half a million dollars in other, other, and we want to do more. I want to get to a million. I want to, you know, I just want to do that because that's what God blesses. See, that's, that's part of the call of the church. I truly believe this. If a church, if a church is not involved in missions, you cease your right to exist because that's part of the call. Understand that's part of the call. We built churches. We built one in Nicaragua years ago that we went, and, that Tammy and I went down to. I want to show you. Okay, bring up the picture. This is in Peru. Okay, this is this is a their anniversary is is coming up this week. This church, you know what the name of that church is? Divine Destiny New Life. We partnered with New Life Ministries down there, and uh, that church is built. That's in a, in a remote area. Uh, they're celebrating their one year anniversary. That's the church that we helped build right there. Not a picture, I think. There it is. Okay. There it is. You can kind of see it there. Divine, Divino, Divino, De Ministrios, or whatever it is. It's Spanish. Uh, Nueva La Vida. Okay. New life. That means new life. So Divine Destiny, new life. We're kind of partnered with them. Okay. They're getting ready to celebrate uh, an anniversary. We, and that's the second church down in Peru. But this is what we do. This is what you do. This is part of where your, your tithes and offerings go to help with that type of thing. And we want to continue to do that as we're getting ready to build a 6,500 square foot addition out there and continue. And we just, we trust God. And one thing that God challenged us with 20 years ago. How many of you have been with us for 20 years? I mean, 20 years. You've been with us for 20 years. We're, you guys, okay, stand up if you've been with us for 20. This is a long time. I mean, this is a long time for you all to put up with us, Okay. Right. Lexus, how old are you? 18. You're not quite there. You're close. Okay, Edie. You were close. You were in your mother's loin, though, so you can go ahead and stand up. Go ahead and stand up. Uh, Stephen, you were here. I'm trying to look who else was here. Chris was here. You are here from time to time. Thank you. Um, Kurt Darla back there. Edney's. Shelly. Ginger. Caitlin, how old are you? You're, you're, you're 20, right? So you've been here the whole time. You've been here pretty much the whole time. Sherry, you've been here. Skylar, you were on your way. They were told they couldn't have a baby. 17 years they were married. Couldn't have a baby. Laid hands on them and, and declared her to come forth. So Skylar's a miracle baby. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So Eileen, there's another one. Okay, praise God. So there's a lot. This, this is how many people put up with us for 20 years. Thank you all. Thank you all for sticking it out, even against the opposition and everything that tried to come against us. My mom and dad back there, yep, also, who were greeting today. Thank you all. You, got, you guys can be seated, but thank you. Thank you all for being there with us. It's been a long journey. It's been a good journey. We've, been, we've got a lot accomplished for the kingdom of God. We've got a lot more to do. Amen? Never stop. We don't, you know, people, somebody asked me the other day about retirement. I said, I really don't know what that word means. I really don't understand that word. It doesn't even, there is no such thing as that. That word does not exist in the kingdom of God. It does not exist in the kingdom of God. Don't even know what it is. Don't have any plans to do that. You know, we're going to continue to, as long as there's breath in his being, we will proclaim the kingdom of God. That's what we'll do. We'll continue to preach and teach and serve and go and do whatever God's called us to do. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm actually sharing on communion today, I think. So... It all connects. I'm going to try to connect it all in there somehow. So go ahead. You guys can get ready to pass out the elements. Uh, the, the ushers, thank you so much as we prepare to take communion, which is one of the, um, one of the ordinances that, that Jesus himself brought to us. Amen? One of those foundational doctrines of the Christian church is, is communion. As we 
partake of the body, the blood of Jesus. And it's, you know what, you know what the purpose is of communion? As we all become one, and, it's, and, and, and one of the main purposes is remembrance, okay? To never, ever forget what Jesus has done for us. To never, ever forget that cross and that sacrifice, amen? And the reason that we have authority over the enemy is because what our Savior was willing to do when he went to the cross. You see, we never do anything apart from Christ, okay? We cannot live apart from Christ. You see, we, cannot, we, we can't die apart from Christ. He had to die first, you understand? There is, no, there is no resurrection without death. So Jesus died, we die, right? He resurrected, we resurrected, right? Jesus walks in glory, we walk in glory. He ascended into heaven, right? We're, we ascended into heaven, according to Ephesians 2. Seated at the right hand of Christ is where Jesus is. That, guess where you are? Seated with him, it says. Okay? So everything, that, everything he's done, we follow. He got baptized, so we get baptized, right? He instituted the Last Supper with communion, so we partake of communion. You understand? He, he was the first. He was the first fruit. He was the firstborn among all creation. Then we follow suit. Okay? He becomes our example when we do everything that he's done. So we do in remembrance of him and his purchase for us, his sacrifice, which was how many, how many times was Jesus sacrificed? One time. How many times is Jesus going to be sacrificed again? Never. You know why? Because the first one was good enough. The first sacrifice was all he needed. Say so he doesn't need another one. So he's not coming to be, he's not coming back to get sacrificed again. Is Jesus, watch this, don't answer this. Is Jesus coming back to defeat the enemy? No. Why? He already did it. He's not coming back to defeat the enemy. The enemy's already been defeated, so he doesn't have to come back to defeat the enemy. He defeated him the first time he was here. He doesn't need to do it again. He was sacrificed the first time he was here. He doesn't need to do it again. Okay? So he's not coming back to be sacrificed. He's not coming back to defeat the enemy. That's not his purpose for coming back. Okay? He's coming back, but not for that purpose. Okay? We've got to understand the purpose. If we, if we think he's coming back to defeat the enemy, then we don't understand that he's already defeated him. The enemy's already under our feet. That's what Jesus said. Okay? It's our job. Okay? It's our job to execute the judgment over the enemy that Jesus already gave us. Okay? It's our job to keep him under your feet. That's a position. You need to understand your position. When you understand your position, that's how you walk in authority. Okay, because every Christian has the same authority. The difference is a lot of Christians don't understand what their authority is. Okay, now you're going to receive two, you're going to receive a double, a double cup here. Okay, you take them apart. And the cracker is underneath. Okay, so you got two cups. Take them apart, and we're going to, and, and we're going to receive this. Now watch. Okay, go to, go to, um, we won't go there. I just, I'm just going to quote it, okay? I don't want to take the time. Paul was given the communion, okay? He was given, he was given to the church at Corinth. And he said that, that, that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took, this, he took, the, he took the bread and broke, okay, broke it, took the cup and, and delivered it. Now, here's what he said. I need to go there. Because I, I, I just want you to see it. Okay, okay 1 Corinthians 11. First, why can't I get there? Somebody just stole it out of my Bible. Okay. Now watch this. Verse 23, I'm going, to go through, I'm going to go through quickly. I want you to understand this. You need to understand this. I haven't taught this for a long time, so that's why I want to say it to you all. Okay? Paul wrote this to the church of Corinth. I received from the Lord that which, also delivered, that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night which he was betrayed, what did he do? He took the bread. Okay? When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he said this, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, what do we do? We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Okay, now what? But watch this. Therefore, in other words, as a result of this, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, everybody say manner, in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak, sick, and many sleep. Why? Okay. 
I want you to understand this a little bit. Because I've heard this preached in a, in a very judgmental religious way. I want you to understand something. A manner is a way or a mode. When you're born again, okay, the moment you become born again, you are absolutely righteous in Christ. You have an exchange, okay? All your sin was covered by the blood and removed, actually, okay? The righteousness of Jesus, which was absolutely perfect, became yours. He who knew no sin became sin so that you could become the righteousness of God in Christ, okay? So we have all received what? His, his righteousness. And you know his righteousness is perfect. His righteousness is what gives you the ability and authority to stand before the presence of God. We come before the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. We don't come because we're good people or we did a lot of stuff or, you know, and all that. We don't come that way. Nobody comes to God that way. You cannot come that way. You can only come through one way, and it's through the blood of Jesus, okay? We come through his blood. That's the access that we have to the very throne of God. That's what it tells us in Hebrews, okay? So, understand it. Well, what happens? When you enter into feeling, everybody say feeling. That's a manner. Feeling as though you're unworthy. See, this is what a lot of people are like when they come before God. They feel ashamed. They feel, how many know in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation, right? That's what we're told, okay, in, in uh, Romans. No condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. So what happens? When we come before God, you need to understand you're not unworthy. You're absolutely worthy. You're worthy because he made you worthy. Does that make sense? He, he, he paid a price for you to be worthy. He paid a price for you to come. He wanted you to come into his presence. So he had to make you worthy because you couldn't be made worthy any other way. You can't be made worthy by anything you do. You can't be made worthy. The only way you can become worthy to God is because of what he did for you. It's all about him. You understand that? So when you come to the communion table, you don't want to come. See, I've, I've heard people are so ashamed to come before God. They're like, oh, he don't, he, oh I'm just feel, I feel so unworthy. God, you know what Paul says? Don't come that way. You should not come with your head bowed down. And I'm not talking about humility here. That's a whole different thing, okay? I get it. I understand that. We should be humble before God. Yes, absolutely. Yes, we are absolutely unworthy apart from Christ, okay? So, yes, we got that. But when you come into the presence of God, you can come into the presence of God with your head held up because of what Jesus did for you. You can come in and you can, here's what, here's what it says in Hebrews. You can come to the throne boldly. What is that? Boldly. You don't have to beg God. I've, I've watched people do this. Sit there and beg God for mercy. Beg God for, you don't have to beg him for forgiveness. You can receive that by faith. You don't have to beg him for something he's already done for you. Okay? Don't get in, don't become a beggar. Become a receiver. Receive the forgiveness. Receive the life. Receive uh, the gifts of God. Receive them. But don't beg for him. Okay, don't become a beggar every time you come before God. Because every time you come before God and you act or you have a manner of being unworthy, guess what you're doing according to the word? You ready for this? You're crucifying Christ again. You're putting, you're putting to death that sacrifice that he already gave once for all. You're crucifying him again. This is what, this is, I wasn't going to get into all this just keeps coming. <laughs> Stuff just keeps flooding my mind. This is what kept Moses out of the promised land. It's the reason why Moses couldn't go in. That's, that's serious. This is Moses, friend of God, could not go into the promised land. You know why? Because he crucified Christ twice. That's the reason. We're told that the rock, the rock that followed the children of Israel tells us this in 2 Corinthians, that rock was Christ. He was the rock. They came and they needed water. And God spoke to Moses and he said this, you go and you strike that rock. So Moses took his rod and he went and he struck the rock. When he struck that rock, water flowed. And it was able to give life. It was able to give refreshment. It was able to give hydration to those who were thirsty. Jesus said, all who call me, you're thirsty, you come to Jesus, right? Well, guess what happened? They came to Moses a second time. And God was very specific. And God looked at Moses and he said, now 
that you've already struck the rock once. He said, this time, just speak to it. Just speak to it. But Moses disobeyed. He took his rod a second time, and he struck that rock again, thus crucifying Christ a second time. We're not supposed to do that. He was angry, see, and he struck the rock out of anger. You see, when we come to God, you don't want to come to God with anger. You don't want to come to God with condemnation. You don't want to come to God in an unworthy manner or you're crucifying him again. You can confess your sins, that's different. You can accept his sacrifice, yes, but don't come in an unworthy manner. Because when you come in an unworthy manner, you're, 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 you know what you're doing? You're laying your righteousness before him, saying, I'm so unworthy, here's my righteousness. It's nothing but filthy rags. You wouldn't even want to bring that into his presence anyway. You don't want to do that. You want to say, Lord, even though I have been unworthy, I have received your sacrifice. And I'm coming by way of your blood, by way of your name, by way of my Savior. I plead your blood here. I come in a worthy manner, a worthy manner because of you. Amen? Don't despise what God's done for you. You can come boldly to the throne of grace in order to receive grace. Amen? Got that? All right, praise God. That's about five hours of teaching right there. So thank you, Jesus. We come into your presence. There's somebody who feels worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, we come into your presence because of what you did for us. We come into your presence absolutely worthy because of your righteousness. We take, Lord, this cracker, which symbolizes your body, and we are thankful for the body of Christ. We are thankful for that sacrifice and your willingness as a human being on this earth that through your obedience... And your death, even the death, a cruel death of the cross, you went there in obedience to your Father on our behalf, and we thank you for it, and we partake of that body in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Mm. We're not like those who are weak and sick because they don't discern the body. We discern the body. Thank you, Lord. We understand what that body's purpose was. And, Lord, we thank you for this blood. This blood brought about an absolute new covenant, an everlasting covenant. It was perfect blood. There was no sin in it, you understand? It was not tainted. It was absolutely perfect, and it was shed and given on your behalf. And it was the only thing, only thing that could forgive your sin. They could actually remove it. It's called remission. The blood of Jesus for the remission of sins. Lord, we partake in remembrance of the new covenant that you were willing to purchase for us through that blood. And we're still, hey, there is still power in the blood. And that blood still speaks today. And it's still doing its work today. And will continue to do its work forever. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Mm. So good. So good. Hallelujah. Well, stand on your feet. And, and as we worship our Lord, we worship our Lord for who he is and what he's done. Thank you, Jesus.
the whole world can be full of hate but we can still be filled with love amen because of whose we are because of who he is and because we belong to him we can know that we are always accepted do you realize you never have to know rejection again and if you are experiencing rejection then you're experiencing a lie now listen to what I'm saying because when you are accepted by God Almighty, who's so-and-so? Who's that person that's trying to, who are they compared to God? You see, the issue is, is we give somebody else more authority in our lives than we do God, if we're letting that affect us. But I'm telling you, we are people that our eyes are being open, and we know who we are, we know who we belong to, and we're just not going to be moved by nonsense anymore. Amen? Is anybody else in the house tired of being moved by nonsense? Well, then let's stop it. Let's get into who Christ is, who we are in him, and start walking in the fullness of all that he has given us. Amen? Well, turn around and tell somebody you love them, but always remember, Jesus loves you more. Well, Heavenly Father, we do come before your holy throne, and first and foremost, we thank you. We thank you for your word that is powerful, your word that is able to transform and change us from the inside out. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that we are doers. We're hearers, and we are doers of your word. We take your word, and we make it ours by reason of you, because, Lord God, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and you are the living word of almighty god so i thank you that we see ourselves through your word and through your truth and we give you praise in jesus name and everyone said amen, amen. well turn with me to second corinthians uh chapter three and i want to um read verse 18 to you and this is in the new king james version it's second corinthians 3 verse 18 and it says but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Everybody say transformed. Woo, into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So it's very vitally important that we learn how to begin to look at ourselves. That we begin to look at ourselves according to what God says, not according to what we think we look like, not according to what we feel like. You know, we really need to put down the mirror of feelings. Now that's a word straight from the throne. Because I'll tell you, we look in the mirror and too many times, instead of expressing how awesome and how glorious our God is, we start expressing our feelings and how we feel and what's not right and what's wrong and we're tired and we're this and we're that and we don't like this and we don't like that and they did this and they said that. It's all about feelings. I'm going to say it. You love when I do. Get over your darling little feelings, okay? For too long, we have left our feelings dictate our actions 
And we walk around and we can't figure out why we don't have the victory in Christ Jesus. And so many times it's because we don't feel like we've got the victory in Christ Jesus. What does our feelings have to do with what our Jesus has already done? Thank you. All right. Now, I have been accused, okay? I'm not saying feelings are okay, but feelings have never been meant to dictate our actions, what we think, or anything like that. So I'm not saying you're not allowed to have feelings. All I'm saying is stop letting your feelings dictate your life, okay? I mean, for real people... What, if you can get set free from this, you are going to be one happy camper. Let me tell you, and I don't know about you, I want happy campers in my tent. Hallelujah. <laughs> and if you all say, no, man, I want like miserable, lousy campers in my tent. No, you don't. Okay, we'll pray for you if that's your thoughts. You know, we'll get you set free there. But, you know, we went... And, and here's what the Lord, um, and I shared this before, but I'll share it real quick. Um, a few months back or a year ago, the Lord showed me, you know, how to manage our feelings, okay? Because our feelings can indicate what we need to break, cancel, and cast out, okay? Because our feelings can begin to expose something in us that needs to go, okay? So remember, I say this all the time. God's exposure is his love at its best, okay? When he's exposing something in us that needs to change, it's because he loves us that much, and we want those things exposed. I know that sometimes it doesn't feel very good that we're just not the, the greatest thing since sliced cheese. But, you know, hey, sometimes we're not and we get to change and God's good. He's very, very good at bringing change in a, a powerful way, not a condemning way. So if you're feeling condemned to change, you're coming at, you're looking in the wrong mirror. Stop looking in the mirror. Don't let anyone else put condemnation on you. Don't let anybody else hold a mirror in front of your face and tell you what you're seeing. Oh, I could preach on this all day long. Hallelujah. <laughs> let the Word of God be the mirror that is in front of your face. And it has to start with us because, you know, so many times we're the only ones that's looking in the mirror. But every once in a while, you will have that wonderful, special person in your life. Could be a coworker, could be a spouse if they're cranky, could be your kids, could be your parents, whatever it might be. That Just love to take that mirror and put it in your face and let you know how you are not there yet. And here's how you respond to it, Okay. If somebody says, you know what, you call yourself a Christian, and you say this, no, that, say, you know what, you're right. But I am so thankful I'm not where I was, and I'm getting to where God wants me to be. Stop letting the condemnation of, oh, I'm not there yet. Well, guess what? None of us are, okay? We're not perfect, but I want to encourage you in this. You have been joined one with Christ Jesus, if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Has everyone in this house received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Okay, everybody? Because, man, we can get, whoo, Jesus is here. He can take care of that, like, right now. Amen? So, you, you've been doing what? So, your spirit, okay? Your spirit is one with Christ Jesus. You are perfect in your spirit. Your soul, on the other hand, hallelujah. That's what continually is in the process of being transformed and being changed into his image. And that's why in our soul, now understand, what is our soul? Our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. Our mind is the way we think, right? Our will is our decisions. And dear Lord God in heaven, do we need Holy Spirit to help us with that one? Amen? And our emotions, okay? So our emotions are not supposed to control us. Is that the truth? 
how many of us, and I can raise my hand too, let our emotions still control us at times? A lot better. There you go. Yeah, we all have that challenge on a daily basis. Why? Because it's a choice. It's a choice every single day to take this word and let it mold the way we think so that we begin to respond with Christ's likeness and not just react to situations and circumstances. I wish I could stand up here and tell you I got it all going on, but then I live with my husband to tell on me. You know, <laughs> because we're, we're in a process. And I truly believe, and this is to just remove condemnation, but I truly believe as long as we walk the face of this earth, we will have the opportunity to have things exposed in our life. We'll have the opportunity to change things. Amen? Because we're being transformed into the very image of Almighty God. Amen? Woo! Wow, that's pretty awesome. All right, so this, this is, we're not going to have this for you up yonder because I'm going to read it from the message, all right? And this is James 1, 22 through, I think, 25. So again, sorry, we won't have it for you up there, but I really like the way it says it in the message. It says, don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but. Letting the word go in one ear and out the other, act on what you hear. Very, very important that we take the Word of God and we begin to apply it. We begin to act on it. Amen? Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in a mirror. All right? So if you're constantly looking in the wrong mirror, that's the challenge. Okay? You've got to take the Word of God, look in the mirror of the Word of God, and then begin to believe what it says and begin to walk in it. Walk away. Oops, wait. I better back up or else I'll confuse you all. Those who hear and don't act like those are like those who glance in a mirror. They walk away and two minutes later have no idea who they are or what they look like. Is that the truth? You can sit there and you can read the Word of God and you're just in your whatever little mode where you've got the Word and all of a sudden you just get this, God loves me. Jesus loves me. Oh man, I am the apple of His eye. Oh, thank you, Lord. And then we walk out and somebody says something mean to us and we forget that Word. We feel miserable. We feel rejected. We feel lousy is because we've not taken that word and really made it ours, that we believe it more than we do what somebody else says or even what we may think, okay? Uh, but whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, the counsel of God, what God thinks about you, and you take what God thinks about you and you put it above what anybody else may think or what anybody else may say, you can begin to be transformed. You can begin to not walk in the rejection. Did you ever, did you ever know hurt and rejected people? I mean, think about it. What do I always say? Hurting people hurt people. Rejected people reject people. Okay? If you walk in that, the only way to come out of it is by taking God's word and, and being more convinced of who God says you are and what God says you can do more than yourself. Okay, because if you're dealing with a lot of offense, a lot of hurt, a lot of rejection, okay, I'm going to step on some toes. You, remember, you are commanded to love me. Okay, if you're walking in those things, it's because you have become more self-centered than you have Christ-centered. You've got the mirror looking at yourself, and you're not, you don't have the mirror looking at at who Christ says you are, looking at Jesus and who he is. Because I'm telling you, once you get the right mirror in front of you, you just become confident, not in yourself, but in who God is and what God says you can do. 
But whoever catches a glimpse of the revealed counsel of God, ah, the free life. You get, you, that's true freedom. Even out of the corner of his eye and sticks with it. Is no, not distracted. Is no scatterbrain. But a man or a woman of action. I don't know, I think we're dealing with a lot of scatterbrain people out there. Why? Because they're looking, even Christians. You know, I get mad whenever I get scatterbrained, you know? Even when you know the Word of God, but you begin to react from what somebody else has said because you've walked away and you've forgotten who you really are. That you forget that I'm forgiven. I'm accepted in Almighty God. You know, why do you sin? I'm going to tell you in 2 Peter, it tells us. One, you sin because you forget that you've been cleansed from your old sins. You forget who you are and whose you are. Okay? That's why you sin. You stay focused on who God is, I'm going to tell you, you're going to walk out of a lot of things a lot easier instead of making it really hard. All right? I know, we don't like hard. Hard is bad. Everybody say, hard is bad. Okay? (laughs) Okay, so... um, When we're continually looking into the word instead of our feelings, we'll begin to manifest the victory of our risen Savior and Lord. Okay? I'm just, I'm I'm trying to, I'm letting God repaint pictures in my mind. Okay? Because have you ever known somebody, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ago maybe, And I'm not denying the fact that something very difficult didn't happen in their life. I'm not denying the fact that, you know, something, a a trauma took place. But come on. Come on. You're going to let that thing dictate your future when God's got an awesome future planned for you. Come on. That's given that foul thing way too much authority in your life. And you need to stop it. There's my counsel to you. Stop it. I love that counsel. Hallelujah. I, do, I use it on myself all the time, so don't feel bad. You know, I start getting weird and itty-bitty, and somebody did this, and somebody said that to me, and somebody hurt my little feeling. It says, I say, seriously, I'm like, stop it. And guess what? I do, and I feel so much better. Hallelujah. All right? So tell you something. Stop it. All right, that's my counsel to you. It's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, the more we do that and the more we focus on Jesus, the more we'll begin to look more like him, to walk more in his love. You know, somebody says something mean to me, and I, I pretty much is just like, wow, okay. I'm not going to receive that in Jesus' name. Thank you anyway. Learn to say that, okay? Because it does really matter. If you do not reject it, you then give it permission to nest in your head. Stop letting things nest in your head, especially if it's not in agreement with God's Word. Now, that doesn't mean if somebody's pointing out, you know, an area that, you know, you're making really bad decisions in. You know, I've seen Christians. Okay. Oh, wow. Praise God. I'm going to go there. Okay. We had, we had an individual years ago, and um, I don't know what happened, but this was an adult. And this adult somehow got highly offended with one of our teenagers. Okay. Everybody say teenagers. We have some awesome ones around here. But how many of you know teenagers... They're still processing through a lot of weird stuff, okay? And if you're going to let the actions of a teenager who's probably still wrapped up in themselves a lot, (laughs) like dictate how you feel and how you look at yourself, we'll pray for you later, okay? But anyway... This, something happened, this teenager did. I think they were 13 or 14 years old, and they did something, and, you know, it, it boiled down to the teenager didn't even have a clue what they did. But here's what this individual did. I kid you not, okay? They would come in, and they would walk around and had, hand everybody candy, okay? Handing out candy, and let's say you're the teenager. 
and just wouldn't, would just walk by. And I'm thinking, that's weird, okay? There, you, got a, you got a small issue there, okay? Not that I'm trying to be condemning, but you got an issue, all right? So, you know, I kind of prayed about it, and I kind of sat him down, and I said, you know, I really think, I think you're walking in some offense here. I am not. Just like, okay, well, you walking up here and handing every adult and every kid a piece of candy and not handing one to this, this individual, you've got an issue, okay? And you need to release, you need to forgive, or something like that. Here's what the individual looked at me and said, okay? I don't sin. I'm just like, whoa, well then I guess the conversation's over, you know? It's just like, I hate to break it to you, but what you're doing is hindering you, you know? And I had an opportunity, and here's what the teenager got to do. They got to grow through it because I talked with them, I walked them through it. They walked through it, okay? More so than the adult did, you know? They, clearly, something needed to be changed. So, you know, whenever I'm, I'm saying, if somebody's coming to you and saying, you know, according to the Word of God, man, that's not cool. You need to do some changing there a little bit. And, and you're just like, nah, 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 I'm, get away from me. You know, I'm good. No. We all get an opportunity to change. Amen? All right. I'm going to focus now. Hallelujah. So, um, when, when we come into the things of God and we begin to look in the mirror of the Word of God, when we begin to come to know who we truly are in Christ Jesus, you know, we've got to understand that just because we're taking the Word of God and we're confident in God, we're believing God, you know, before you pray something, make sure you're believing God for something, okay? Make sure you're believing God. Years ago, whenever the Lord spoke to us about being debt-free. We didn't come, we didn't go tell everybody. You know why? Because we had to get in the Word of God. We had to be fully convinced. We knew that's what God wanted, but we had to be convinced. We had to choose to believe God's Word. And we knew that we knew that God was going to do it, okay? Why is that so important? It's important because do you think for one moment when God tells you to do something or when he says something to you, it's just going to be a cakewalk? I promise you it will not be. The moment that God tells you to do something, all of hell will break loose because that word is what the enemy is after to try to cancel in your life. He's not after you. He is after the word of God in your life to try to discredit it so you stop believing God, okay? So anyway, the Lord spoke that, and we prayed, and we spent, I don't know, probably months just going through the word of God, getting the word of God, saying, thank you, Lord, this is what you're saying. Thank you, Lord, you're building in us the, the structure to believe you for this because it looked impossible to us, okay? I'm just being honest. So when something looks impossible, I fully know that God is possible, okay? But I also fully know that my thinking can get in the way, so I better get the mirror of the Word of God for that truth, and I better know that I know that I know it, and I better have confidence in what God has said more than in what my thinking might be, more in, than what somebody else will, will say or do, okay? Because I'm fully aware that when God speaks something, if the opposite happens or it doesn't happen when I think it should, the enemy's going to try to bring defeat, um, discouragement. He's going to try to make us quit and give up and just go the same route. But that is not how we do things. We get the word of God, okay? So we did. We spent months, and then we brought it before um, y'all, and we just said, here's what we believe in. Believe God with us, and we started teaching on it. You know, we started teaching you all how to begin to believe God to be debt-free, okay? 
and, and you know, the scriptures that we were standing on. And we had, we had declared and we were praying that we would be debt-free by the end of the year, okay? And the end of the year came and went, and we weren't debt-free. <laughs> Guess what? We were not moved. Why? Because we already got the word of God and we were convinced it was God and that he was going to do it. And I can remember years later, one of the youth came and they said, well, they're not a youth anymore, but anyway, um, came and said, do you remember when you guys were praying that and declaring it and speaking it? And it's just like, and it didn't happen. And they said, you weren't moved. You were not, like, that didn't shake you at all. And, you know, it didn't happen at the end of the year, but it did happen three months later. I think March. I think it happened in March. So, see, that is why when you get a word from God, it is so important that you build yourself up in the word of God because the enemy will try to distract you. Think about it. When God called the children of Israel out of Egypt, okay, and he said, "Woo, I'm taking you to the promised land. Did it happen overnight? It didn't, no. <laughs> Did it even happen in the amount of time it should have happened? Because it should not have taken 40 years, people. You know, there was some disobedience. You know what gets me? And I love this story, because Joshua and Caleb... They go in, and they, well, the 12 spies, go in, they spy out the land, all right? They, 10 of them come back with an evil, it's called an evil report. Do you know what they reported? The facts. They were fact checkers. <laughs> we don't listen to them anyway, hallelujah. We got something better than the fact checkers. So anyway, the, the 10 came back with an evil report, and they were just kind of telling the facts. This is how it is. Yeah, and there's giants, and they're big. And, and, and here's what they said. We're like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we're grasshoppers in theirs. They were looking in the wrong mirror. They forgot who their God was. They were looking in the wrong mirror. Then you got Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb are like, oh, we're more than able to take the land. That's what, Caleb, Caleb stands up and that's what he says. You know what they want to do? For, for him just speaking God's truth. Stone him. They want to stone him. So why do you need to be built up in the word of God? Because once you start speaking what God has said to you according to the word of God, you're going to get some stones slung at you probably. And you better have the shield of faith up to withstand that and to block it and to back it up. I am preaching glad, not mad. Hallelujah. This is a good thing, isn't it? It is good. Hallelujah. So here's Joshua and Caleb, okay? They speak the truth. They're with God. Do you realize they still had to walk around the desert and go on a camping trip with millions of miserable people, not for one year, not for five years, not for 10 years, 40 years for the love of God. That's a long time to put up with doubters and miserable people. Amen? Whew. But here's the thing. When it came time to go into the promised land, Caleb's now 85 years old. And he says, I am more than able. Give me my mountain. I'm going. He, 40 years, God spoke a word, and he was not discouraged or swayed at all. He held on to the God of the promise. You know, and, and we want to be careful. I love the promises of God, but we better love the God of the promise more than we do the promises of God because it is the God of the promises that will sustain us to believe God 
for what he has spoken to us. But it's only as we continue to look into the word, into the truth of what God has to say. So I want to encourage you, if you're believing God for something, just, you know, just don't, yeah, I'm believing God. God's a God of the impossible. Yeah, we can say all those things, but you had better know it. You had better know that you know that you know, and you had better have the confidence of God in that area because everything will try to get you to disbelieve what God has said. Okay? So, you know, why did we? Why did we spend months just looking up about God's provision to believe God to be out of debt? Because when it didn't happen in our time frame, we weren't moved. We already knew that God was going to do it. You know, we could have got, you know, some people, well, you said, you said. Well, you know what? I fully realize I ain't God, okay? But I do know what God has said. And sometimes, you know, my timing may not always be right, but I know my God is faithful and he is true. Amen? Ah, hallelujah. God is good. Well, um, let's see. I think I'm going to. I think I'm going to stop there. I'll continue this here in a couple of weeks because I got a lot more. <laughs> I've got a lot more to share with you all. I know it's really exciting, but <laughs> you're all going to have to wait because I know hangry people are not good, okay? And about noon, you all start getting hangry, and, and you start looking at me like, I need my food. I need my food. Hallelujah. Well, we just gave you a feast of the Word of God, but I too know that we need nourished also. So let's stand to our feet. Heavenly Father, I come before you, and I thank you so much for your goodness. I thank you for your truth. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that right now you are causing us to put down those mirrors that make us look at anything else other than the truth of your word. I thank you, Holy Spirit, your teaching and training us to pick up the mirror of the word, to grab a hold of the truth of your word, and to be established boldly and confidently according to your word, O oh God. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. Right now, I... I do I cancel and I break every word curse that has been spoken over anyone in this house. I cancel um, evil reports, even if they quote were factual. I cancel those that do not line up with your word of truth that says we're healed, we're delivered, we're prosperous, we're we're completely whole in you, Lord God. And I thank you, Father God, for just establishing that confidence in your word. Holy Spirit, release in us a holy hunger for the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you all.